Have you ever wondered how television network music departments choose the music for their favorite shows? Well, if you have, then you definitely want to check out our featured interview with Senior Vice President of Music at NBC Universal, Alison Schneider. We discuss a wide range of topics, including the broadening of musical styles used in television, how she discovers new music today, and the most effective way to get on her radar, and much, much more. This is one episode you don't want to miss. Coming up. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. We're coming at you live from Muse Expo here in Hollywood at the Roosevelt Hotel. We managed to catch up with Alison Schneider, VP of Music and Creative Services at NBC Universal. Alison, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, the whole aspect of music is so interesting. And from a network standpoint, NBC Universal has a lot of platforms. Can you talk about what those platforms are in terms of your role involved in, with music? Yeah, we have multiple networks, so um, if I can even remember them all, I mean, we're NBC, we're USA, we're Oxygen, we're Sci-Fi, we're MSNBC, CNBC, we just acquired Style, we just acquired E, Bravo, so we service all of the networks that are controlled by NBC Universal Television, and then we also have a sports network, and we do webisodes, and uh, we work very closely with our international group now on some of their programming. And um, we produce things for not just our networks, but we also produce things for a &E, and we've got two shows on Fox, so multiple networks. Interesting. So NBC produces a show for Fox. We do. We produce The Mindy Show and The Mindy Project and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So those are, that's our studio. And so my group actually works on them. So we, okay. we do create them on Brooklyn Nine-Nine and clearance, and we clear on Mindy. Interesting. So... One of the things that I guess in just listening to your answer, it seems like the amount of platforms, the amount of music uses has increased tremendously. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I think it's more because we have more of a volume. Like, I think it's it's not necessarily more music in the shows, but it's more shows to be music. OK, so, so there's, a, a, there's a lot of opportunities out there. OK, at what point? Do music supervisors or do people like yourself get involved with the various shows? Is it at script stage? Is it wh when does that happen? Um, well, it's always in script stage. I mean, for me, it's usually much earlier just because we're the studio. So, um, you know, I get involved with the producers as soon as they're staffing up and, you know, they start thinking about that because as they start thinking about the main titles that are going to be created, they, you know, music is obviously a part of that. So I'll get involved with starting to talk about composer selections. And then once we're, you know, maybe two, three weeks out from starting production, that's when they'll really kind of hone in and focus on music and, okay, let's get a composer on board, let's get a supervisor on board. And it might be either one of my team of music supervisors in-house or we'll start looking out of house. They may have someone in mind that they want to bring on as well. And then we're on it through the whole process. Then it's, you know, the script to spotting session to final delivery. And beyond final delivery, it seems like you're also involved in promo mm -hmm. um, d and different platforms within promo, like promo online, promo on the network itself. Exactly. And Looking for market and maybe particular marketing opportunities with brands. So it could be all kinds of things. It could be uh, cross promotional tie ins, you know, with the Olympics where you're maybe trying to tie something in with a show or or um, even though we don't produce the voice. I mean, we oftentimes are getting involved in opportunities with that where we're trying to take maybe a voice winner and try to do a cross marketing promotional push with another NBC Universal entity. So it's, it's pretty vast, the things that we are called upon to do and it, always changing. It's, you know, 
just in terms of those platforms, one of the things also, as they have expanded, one of the things I've noticed is that the amount, not only the amount of music, but the type of music that's used in, in film and TV today, especially television, has broadened 20-fold. Uh, I think 15, 20 years ago, you would see music that was much more narrow in its focus. A lot of iconic titles, things that everybody knew, right. you know, whether it was Motown songs or, or just classics. But now you seem to have a much, much wider palette. Do you find that a lot of producers and different shows that you're working with are open to using unsigned artists in their shows or, you know, rather than just things that are by labels and big publishers? Absolutely. But I think that's also because the, um, the delivery method has changed, you know, 20 years ago. If we were going to hear new things, we heard it from the labels. You know, we were only able to get it from somebody sending it to us or going out and buying it. And I think that's also why we went probably more back catalog as well, because the volume that we had to choose from wasn't as vast. Whereas now, you know, the producers can find it themselves. They can go on YouTube, they can find things on satellite radio. So I think it's created a broader audience and probably even more of a fan base because people can discover. And because there is so much, it. I kind of, I was actually thinking about this the other day. It's probably so much more difficult. I know with us for the majors to get something to us because we are so excited about things that we're finding. And it's like, okay, well, I don't know if I necessarily want to focus on this major person that I know is probably going to add, end up in a car campaign or something like that when I can use something over here that nobody's heard before and maybe break it or be the person to discover it. And we have some producers that are really into discovery also. So promos, I think I'd said to you earlier, you know, it, that varies in that promos tend to want to be a little bit more identifiable just because they want to get people's attention and they think by having something familiar, they're more apt to keep them in the room, but definitely not for series. Interesting. The, you know, in listening to your answer, one of the things that comes to mind is that with the vastness of music and the amount of discovery that can be made by producers as well as people yourself, I guess my question is, you know, for someone in your position, what are the sources you go to for discovery today? Uh, is it strictly online? Is it a multitude of things? How do you discover new things today? I think when, you know, I feel like every time I'm asked this question, I I know I'm discovering, but I don't know how. Um, it uh, Some of it I think is through osmosis. I mean, you've got the labels pitching you, the publishers, the managers, you've got song aggregators, you've got music libraries, um, agents, bands themselves, you know, because now, We've been in a situation for years now where we can actually meet people and you go to festivals and you, you get relationships and maybe sometimes those bands form other bands. And so you're turned on to it that way or they have friends that are in bands. And so that way, radio, you know, still I listen to a lot of satellite radio when I walk in the morning. Sometimes I put on Pandora. So it, there's just constant discovery. I don't really have time to troll online very often. My daughter will suggest something that maybe she's found. Um, but it just happens. But I think also when you realize that there are all those different places that it's coming from, how much of a miracle it is when you do hone in on something. Because besides having so many places to find it, you know, then you've got so many people on each production that have an opinion about the things that you're giving them. So it really is kind of like winning the lottery most of the time. I don't think um, any of us necessarily have a lot of opportunity to be the sole person who is saying this is the song you're going to put in the scene anymore. I think once in a while there's a project like that, but not very often. I mean, it really is kind of, I think it, I think it, it's a village that is music supervising projects these days. There's so many people that I think are an integral part of it. And for us with the volume that we have, we need these people to pitch to us and to actually do specific pitches and do their research and learn about our shows. So in essence, I think sometimes there's 15 or 20 music supervisors on a show if you really look at it at the end of the day and who really is supplying for that and as mm -hmm. opposed to who's listening. And it's interesting, you know, as, as you speak about that, one of the things I'm realizing is that, you know, you and your team at, at NBC have a specific, you have a large volume of shows that you're working. Uh, my question to you is, you know, at what point or how do you determine uh, in your business whether you're going to use an independent music supervisor outside of the NBC team or not, whether the NBC team is going to take it in or, you you know, you're saying, no, I need to give this to someone specific. Different factors. Um, some producers love certain people. You know, they're familiar with them. And so we never want to get in the way of that. We want them to be comfortable. 
So, um, you know, in that case, nobody will ever raise their hand on my team and say, I want to do that show. You know, we just know automatically that probably person will probably come on board. Uh, I also assess actually different things like, do we really want the show? Is it amazing? Do I feel like I'm going to shrivel up and die if I don't get to music supervise this show? And then I'll do full court press and try to sell myself for it or try to sell one of my team members. If it's a show I don't think we can handle, then I'll want to go out of house. Like if it's something that maybe we're not familiar with, like when we did Smash, you know, we've never produced a musical before. None of us. I mean, all most of us know are what we've produced in house right. and we've never done a musical. And we knew that that was going to require not only expertise, but a time commitment that we just could not give. So that was an absolute out of house. Um, so that those are factors, too, that come into play or. If you just know maybe you've worked with a production team before and you just felt like maybe it wasn't a good fit, because it really is a marriage. And if it doesn't work out well and it doesn't feel right, then you kind of don't want to go that, down that road again. We assess volume also. I mean, I look at my team and how many shows that they have and we sit down and we really talk about, OK, can you still give them 100 percent? Are they going to feel like they're getting your full attention or do we need to kind of put this one out of house until you lose a couple of shows and can pick up some more? So. Tons and tons of factors, really, for everything, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Allison, with the proliferation of music, we, we've been talking about just the amount of variety and the amount of volume that's that's come about, especially with technology in the last 10 years. Do you find that in your position, because that's available to you, that the price of music has come down uh, in terms of being able to license it? That it's more reasonable than it was perhaps years ago? Yeah, I think we forced it down because things had gotten so expensive and we really had to try to respond to that quickly. And the way we responded was really delving into the independent music that was available and trying to see what we could find and re-educating our producers and showing them that just because they hadn't heard of it didn't mean it wasn't wonderful. And as they got a taste for it, unfortunately, it kind of backfired in that um, I think the, the studios and the networks could see, it's like, wow, you could really fill this with something amazing for a fraction of the cost. So you don't need all that money in your budget. And, and I saw that over the course of a couple of years where they would look at the end of a season and kind of see what our average was. And it was like, oh, you guys were coming in less than projected. So we're gonna start you down here now. And I really don't see it ever going up again. I think where we are is where we're gonna be. But um, it's interesting because the labels, you know, the majors have had to come down, but then once in a blue moon, you see some pushback where they're trying desperately to get it up again. And we're just like, there's nothing we can do. There's nowhere we can go unless we borrow from ourselves, which, you know, happens yeah. sometimes to pay for something. Where you'll take money from another episode yeah, to, exactly. to get it for one episode and then... Which is kind of scary because you don't know. And yeah. I've got that on Royal Pains right now where we're, we, you know, you are borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And it's like, we're borrowing in the early on in the season. And it's like, okay, well, we're gonna make it up. It's like, but we don't really know what the storylines are gonna be either. So maybe six, seven episodes in, we're gonna wanna do something really dynamic, but we already spent it. So, so you're we stuck have to, with the price. Yeah, exactly. have, yeah, with the budget that you have left. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, as a music supervisor, one of the questions that, you know, I guess you get asked a lot, which I think our, our viewers would be interested to know, is how does someone get on your radar? Uh, is it through a library? Is it through direct pitching? Is it through a placement service? What are the aspects or the elements that you use to find new things or for people to reach you? For me, because of the volume that I'm dealing with, it's usually the placement services. And each show has different placement services that I think are a better fit just because they do tend to sign the same kind of genres. I mean, for the most part, you know, you have the ones that are a little bit more indie, indie, darker oriented or the ones that actually are a little bit more mainstream pop. And so when I started series, I kind of identified who those aggregators are going to be that I think are the best fit. And those are really ultimately when I was saying my other music supervisors, those people go with me for the entire season and I'll be like, okay, I need something for these three scenes. This is the, this is what I'm looking for. And they'll send a ton and I'll choose from that. And I just start learning the bands, you know, I think, but it's coming pretty much from somebody doing a pitch of like, here's 40 songs and, or I, you know, or I pick it up on the radio or whatever on, on satellite radio, or you open a package and it catches your attention. But I kind of rely on the pitching people more than anything these days, just because I don't have the time 
to sit down and put different CDs in or find all the individual emails and pop them open. And a lot of those people too, you know, what's great about them. Um, and it's the same with the labels and the publishers as well is they do do that research and they know what we're working on. They know what we like. They get to know us as people. So they know what we respond to individually. So they'll do pitches just cold also like, oh my God, Allison, I've got this new band. You're going to love this band because I know you love blah, 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 blah. And because you trust these people, you do actually stop and listen and, and value it. So that becomes the, the trusted source. Definitely. They're, yeah. they're like a trusted source, like those libraries that you're going to or the placement companies are trusted sources for specifically what you know they can bring to that sensibility of show. And trust is a big deal. And I think that's why it's probably so difficult to break through individually and get someone's attention is that there's so many factors we have to know that they actually are representing something properly, that they do indeed own it and that nobody's going to come out of the woodwork and that they understand the process. They understand contractually what we're asking of them because we don't have time to educate them. And because things move so quickly, especially in TV, that's why we go to the trusted sources because we don't have to teach them anything. They are never gonna give us something that they know that they can't give us and they know what we're working in budget wise. And you know, oftentimes we don't have to paper anything with them ahead of time. We can deal with it and then get to it later or send it verbal. It's like, okay, this is great. Okay, thank you. Right. We'll deal with this on Thursday when I have more time. Right. Yeah, and it, all that is huge for us. Okay. so. I guess one of the things that's interesting, one of the things I heard Alex Petsavis say once about this question. No, huh? I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> uh, who's another music supervisor is that the way to think of it is how can I serve the needs of that show or that film rather than here's my music. Can you find a place for it in your world? Right. It's a different kind of consciousness. And what you articulated, I thought was so interesting, which is what reminded me of that is that you talked about all the unspoken things that you have to consider mm -hmm. behind it in terms of trust, in terms of papering, in terms of, you know, can I rely that this is completely, you know, available? You're not going to come back to me and, you know, and say, no, there's a sample or something like that. So that becomes just such a, uh, I guess, a valuable kind of point in terms of your trusted services, trusted yeah. resources, because I think that's one of the things people want to know the most. How do I reach you? How do I reach you? And I think if you educate them, they begin to understand it's more about a whole process than just reaching somebody with a CD or with a piece of music. And that stuff's difficult too. I mean, I've ended relationships with people that I had considered trusted sources because they burned me in wow. the end. And one person in particular, I mean, I was at South by Southwest and I got a call and it turned out something he had given me for an episode of Heroes. He only had 50%. He thought he had 100%. And the other 50% was not indie. It was Warner Chapel. And we were on the dub stage. And I think we had three hours left before that episode had to be completely locked for air. And he just kind of threw his hands up. He's like, well, I can give you something else. It's like, I'm standing on 6th Street. I can't even get it to them. I mean, this was at a time when it wasn't as easy for us to get the music to them. And nobody could do it for me because they were all on South Congress and 6th Street and there was nobody there to do anything to help. And I gave him another chance actually a couple of years ago and it happened again. And I just thought, God, this guy's sloppy. I mean, that was what I realized is I can't trust him. He doesn't really know what he's representing. And no matter how great the music is, I can't afford to do that. I can't. And so I still hear from him, but I just don't respond or I'll say hello, but I don't have anything. But it's so critical for us. And that happens usually once or twice a year, unfortunately, where we find out at the very last minute that there was a problem. That's unfortunate. Or a band has decided that maybe they have, have had some success and they're just not interested in licensing or they're not interested in the fees that we're offering. Whereas when the song came to us, it was a completely different story. That's difficult. That's, that's probably one of the most difficult things you have to navigate as a music supervisor is really keeping your eye on where that artist is at in their career and whether or not it's still available because we get them in, in avids and can't really get them back out either. So sometimes we lose track of what the editors have, especially if, if a show's on the air for a few years. What is the, the best part of your job working with music? Hearing, I, I think just being able to discover and hearing things before everybody else sometimes. I mean, that's pretty darn exciting when yeah. the labels come in and yeah. especially when they know you're a fan of a band and maybe they'll slip you a track just when it's out of the studio and trust you or watermark it. And 
And then I like the people. I mean, that's the other part of it, I think, is the social aspect. And you, you meet really wonderful people and who are you know, kindred spirits because we're all in it, because we're all huge music fans. And I think we all grew up the same way, listening to records or CDs and just having a voracious appetite for anything that we could get our hands on. Exactly. So that's the best part. Some great food for thought with Allison, especially for those of you looking to gain more insight into getting your music into film and television. So, insiders, here's the question of the day. From our conversation with Allison, what were the most valuable takeaways to you? Was it the wider variety of music now licensed for film and television? Or was it the sources that she goes to for music today? Or was it how you get on her radar with your music? Or maybe it was something else that resonated with you. We'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. In addition, we recently put together a free guide on the best strategies to use when contacting music supervisors. This is extremely important before submitting your music for any film or TV show. So if you're interested in receiving it, we've included a link to that in the description below. It's totally free and it goes through the top do's and don'ts before you even think about submitting your music out to music supervisors. Questions such as asking yourself, is all the correct metadata and correct information included into my music? Have I checked the links to any music that I'm submitting to make sure that they are working? Are your sync and master rights of the recording and song pre-cleared? This is a valuable guide into learning the art and etiquette of submitting your music to music supervisors and to the community, one that you can't afford to be without. So if you're interested in receiving that, we'll link in the description below. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the description as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and types of content you want to see on our channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.